The following program is made possible in part by grants from public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Good evening. Some 3,000 Democratic delegates open their national convention here in New York tonight, apparently so in tune politically that the gathering threatens to sound like a meeting of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Not so the Republicans. Their battle to produce a candidate turns bloodier each day. So while we wait to see what the Democratic convention produces, we focus tonight on the bitter weeks ahead for the Republicans. Here's the situation. Over the weekend, both President Ford and Ronald Reagan picked up delegates. By most accounts, Mr. Ford did slightly better than expected in Colorado and North Dakota. And while Reagan narrowed the delegate gap, his momentum may have been slowed. According to Hal Bruno, whose expert delegate count for Newsweek magazine we've been following in recent weeks, the picture today looks like this. With 1,130 delegates needed for nomination, Mr. Ford now has 1,051 firm and Reagan 1,016. Next weekend, the last 55 delegates will be chosen in Connecticut and Utah. According to Newsweek projections, Ford will win 33 and Reagan 22. Then Ford will have 1,084 and Reagan 1,038. But 135 delegates have been elected ostensibly uncommitted. Newsweek feels able to give 61 of those to Mr. Ford and 47 to Mr. Reagan. If those projections held, Mr. Ford would go to the Kansas City Convention with 1,145 votes to 1,085 for Reagan, and that would mean a first ballot nomination for Mr. Ford. But given the swirling political currents surrounding the uncommitted delegates, no one is confident in saying that it's locked up. Tonight we look at the increasingly bitter infighting that surrounds these last crucial delegates. Jim? Robin, as could be expected in such a tight situation, the infighting between the Ford and Reagan camps has already turned rough. The roughest blast thus far came over the weekend from Tom Curtis, the former Republican congressman from Missouri and ex-chairman of the Federal Election Commission. Mr. Curtis is a Reagan delegate and chairman of the Missouri delegation, and he's upset over the way the Ford people have been operating. Mr. Curtis, what's your basic complaint? The fair play. Uh, the National Committee, uh, under the new laws, receiving, like the Democratic National Committee, $2 million to run the campaign, is cast in the role of an umpire. It should not show partiality over any candidate over another. The National Committee has granted to Ford uh, about 400 more uh, gal receipts, for example, than has Reagan, because they have given Reagan forces so many, Ford forces so many, and then the White House it gets double that amount. They've done the same thing with housing. They're doing it along these lines and not playing the role of an umpire. Every big position in the National Committee is filled by a Ford designee. The National Committee, in my judgment, uh, is not playing it fair, and uh, it's a matter for them to answer. The best thing to do, of course, is to correct it, and then we'll be very happy. Of course, they have said uh, that they are not going to correct it, however, in exchange of, of letters uh, between counsel on the Reagan committee, etc. That's why uh, you said infighting. I say, uh, let's get the fighting out in the open so the public understands what it is and let the public be a judge whether we're saying this is fair or unfair. I think clearly the public would regard this is outrageous. It's that unfair. All right. Unfair, outrageous. Is it, uh, is it illegal? I think it probably is, yes, because the National Committee, having accepted uh, taxpayers' money to run the convention, now is under law required to be a fair umpire. Yes, I think it would be. What effect do you think these tactics, as you laid them out, uh, will have on who gets the nomination uh, itself? Uh, these are little things, perhaps, as far as that's concerned, but they, as you say, this is a very close, and so these little things make a difference. But even more significant, in this time of uh, post-Watergate, I think it's most important for both political parties and all candidates to be exercising, leaning over backwards 
to give fair play, to get reform, to let the people know it isn't politics as usual, but it's a higher plane. Is it, are you suggesting in any way that the Ford forces are in their unfairness, as you say, are attempting to, just to be blunt about it, steal the nomination? Well, I wouldn't use the word, well, it lead, let's get, say getting the nomination through unfair tactics, winning a game by cheating. Yes, uh, that's what it is, and the American public understand what this is. Regrettably, all too much of this is going on. Leo DeRocher says, good guys finish last. I don't believe that. Some people say winning is the sole name of the game. I don't believe it. It's winning according to fair rules. If we will abide by fair rules, we all of us know how to take a licking and come on back and get behind the person that wins. But if they're win through unfair tactics, then you do leave sore spots. So in other words, what you're saying is that the tactics now being employed in these areas that you laid out and others by the Ford people would mean that if in fact President Ford is, the no is nominated, he will have done so, he will have gotten the nomination as a result of unfair tactics. Th this would, yes, they would bear on this, yes. All right, sir, thank you. Robin? F. Clifton White is one of the most experienced political strategists in the Republican Party. He had a crucial role in securing Goldwater's nomination in 1964 and is now serving as an advisor to the President Ford Committee. Mr. White, what do you think of Congressman Curtis's charges? Oh, I think they're the kind of charges that you frequently get when you get into a difficult campaign and uh, you're a little bit behind. You try to find those issues and use that rhetoric that you think will enable you to persuade or establish people support in direction of your candidacy. But it is true that all the uh, important posts at the convention have been given to friends of Mr. Ford, is it not? Yeah, I think it's true. I think it's also true that Mr. Ford is president of the United States, that the Republican National Committee is composed of two national committee people plus a state chairman from all of the states, and that this action was unanimously ratified by them. This is the machinery of the party making these decisions. Now, they are never going to be a decision that satisfies everybody when there is a contest involved. Given the um, extreme closeness of the race for the Republican nomination, is it likely that either before the nominating votes themselves, or vote itself, that in procedural votes, some of which could be determined by, in some way by officers of the convention, votes affecting the nomination could be made. In other words, could the nomination af be affected by procedural votes, which in turn could be affected by some of these officers? The, you can say that, that that is possible. My judgment is that will not be the case. Uh, always in theory there is a, a certain amount of uh, authority left to a presiding officer that can be critical. But by and large, rules and regulations and parliamentary procedures are pretty clearly defined, and I think a good deal of what you're looking at right now tends to be more the rhetoric of a campaign than the substance of the elected but process. It's, it's not unknown at conventions for rules to be changed at crucial moments uh, to affect one candidate or another. For instance, the Taft-Eisenhower struggle in 1952. Well, the Taft-Eisenhower struggle in 52 is the one everybody's trying to go back to, and that's why we're getting the same kind of language, fair play, Texas Steel, all this sort of thing, and it depends on which side of the coin you were on as to which words you were using at that time, and I think the same thing applies today. A convention body is the body that's established by a political party to make the decisions as to how that party is going to be run, and the majorities according to the rules, majorities or two-thirds are allowed to provide for the orderly conduct of the business of that particular convention. And the people who lose will never be happy and the people who win will be exceedingly happy. But would you concede that it might be stacking the little deck a little bit if the rules can be changed at crucial points in the convention for one side to hold most of the convention offices? No, I, I really don't think holding the convention offices has any significance at all. I think the gentlemen who are holding those offices are men who have held public and party office in the Republican Party in the United States of America for a considerable number of years. They are known as men who are fair and honest and reliable. Uh, and therefore, I do not think that in any instance, you know, allegations as to their fairness 
will stand up in, in the framework of the Republican Party. Now, I don't object to the excitement. I think the excitement's fine. We Republicans wanted to have a little excitement this year so that people pay some attention to us. We recognize that we're the minority. But you have to remember that these rules and procedures, the ability to change them, the ability to follow them, have existed for a considerable period of time. They've then debated in the Republican National Committee for a period of time. And you never are going to lock them in, nor should you where they cannot be changed to expedite the business in a fair manner of any convention. Thank you. Jim? All right, Robin, Clark Reed is the Republican state chairman of Mississippi and generally considered to be one of the most powerful Republicans in the South. So powerful, in fact, that he was one of only a few politicians President Ford saw fit to invite to his White House dinner for the Queen of England last week. Mr. Reed, how does it look from your perspective? Are the Ford people playing dirty pool? Well, this has been a concern of mine for some time. I come from a state that's had both parties di divided uh, ours in the first part of the century, and once we got together, the Democrats were split, and they're together for the first time. So this has been a special awareness of mine. I think uh, I agree with both Mr. Curtis and Cliff White, uh, Tom Curtis and Cliff White. I think that what the uh, Ford forces have done to date in the convention has been rather poor politics than anything uh, uh, illegal, but I think it's... Is it unfair? Uh, Would you use the, Mr. Curtis' well, word unfair? Well, the, the, the thrust of direction disturbs me. I think that uh, I think it would have been smarter of them to have thrown a few bones, the tickets and the positions on the, on the uh, convention the other way. But I'm concerned. There, there are two facets I'm most concerned with is, and I've given some rather hard words to some of the Ford Committee lawyers about this, is they approach this from a legal matter. Uh, when, when, when the, as I tell them, the judge and jury hears this convention. It's not nine... Uh, old men in black robes, so they better think of the politics of what they're doing. They've been interjecting law where law doesn't exist. I think, now, the Reagan forces may be doing it too, but I've not had them reported to me. Uh, we've set ourselves up as a quasi-policeman in this thing. I've told our delegates, our 30 uncommitted delegates, I feel so strongly about this that I would recommend they vote against whatever candidate is overtly uh, playing with the rules to the point where we all lose in this convention. And is that what you feel the Ford people are on the verge of doing? Well, uh, I don't like this thrust right. and, and the other than that I see uh, playing with the laws. We'll know the 16th is a critical date. That's 30 days uh, before the convention, which is, mm -hmm. is the theoretical filing deadline for uh, challenges. In the past, challenges have been on the, uh, from delegate against delegate within the state, like in the history of my state. There's a new thrust that's top-down. So we're going to challenge the whole state or part of it from the Ford Committee. I'm disturbed by this. The other side of the coin, I, I hear conversation. I haven't seen anything at all about it, and I must say I've seen nothing from the Reagan camp at all. But I hear uh, concern about uh, delegates uh, jumping traces where they're committed by law and some of the changes have come about where party rules will have a hard time applying. So uh, well, those now that, are my two concerns. All right, now let's explain what that means. Let's, let's say there's a, a delegate who is, uh, because of a, of a primary vote or whatever, is committed to Ford, and yet he is a closet Reagan voter and the, the word being that he will not vote for Ford on the first ballot, he will abstain and then vote for Reagan on the second ballot, something like that. That's what you mean, right? Those are my two areas of concern, that, yeah. that uh, people do what they're supposed to by law or convention direction, uh, and, uh, and that, number one, number two, that the both candidates take a clear-cut position and that they don't want any delegate that's not theirs and not uh, interject law that does not belong in party rules. All right, Mr. Reed, one final thing. Now, you were invited to the White House to the, Queen, to the Queen's dinner, and uh, the situation, correct me along the way if I'm wrong, is that you've got 30 delegates from Mississippi. They are technically uncommitted at this point. They will caucus because you have the unit rule, and uh, the, the word is that uh, the majority of them lean toward Reagan and that you privately also lean toward Reagan. So let, let me ask you this. Did the invitation to the White House and you, as I said at the beginning in your introduction, mm -hmm. you're one of the few politicians, you hold 30 votes uh, somewhere in your hands. Uh, does this constitute unfair play in terms of trying to manipulate votes for President Ford? Well, I'm senior chairman of the United States, and, I, and they had a cross-section of uh, Hollywood, and I think maybe a, a Southern Republican wasp is a good token exhibit that should be in, included, too. I think that's probably the primary reason I was there. All right, so take your word for it. Thank you, Robin. <laughs>
Richard Rosenbaum is another key figure in the pre-convention struggle for the Republicans. As state chairman of the party in New York and a close associate of former Governor Rockefeller, it was Mr. Rosenbaum who took the bulk of the huge New York delegation into the Ford camp at a crucial point in May and who last week managed to milk a further nine Ford delegates from the uncommitted column. He was also important enough to be invited to the state dinner for the Queen of England last week, I believe. Well, I was, as a, I was there. As there. <laughs> Not as a wasp, though. <laughs> Um, how do you read this struggle in terms of the discussion we've been having? How do you see the tactics that have been used in preparing for the convention by the Ford camp? Well, first of all, I think that uh, Mr. White's comments were absolutely on the target. That uh, uh, This is what happens when you have a close contest. I don't see any uh, untoward activity on anybody's part. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you might turn it around and say that I haven't heard from the Reagan forces saying that uh, they have any objections to the fact that in 1972 the convention voted a, a delegate uh, apportionment formula that tended to give uh, smaller states such as in the West and the South a greater say than in the, in the large states like New York. I haven't heard any holler of foul about that. So, uh, uh, you know, these are the things that go on and uh, you live with them and I think as uh, has been pointed out, after it's over with, uh, the winners are happy, and the ones that lost, we hope, will, will join in and uh, not be too unhappy. Well, let's come to that in a moment. Has Mr. Ford got it locked up? In my judgment, Mr. Ford will be nominated on the first ballot. Your role in helping him to lock it up, was the uncommitted so-called New York delegation always a reservoir to be tapped for Mr. Ford whenever Governor Rockefeller, the vice president, gave the signal? <laughs> no, hardly. Uh, it happens that there are some uncommitted, there were some, and they do uh, become a reservoir of possibilities, providing the, some of the uncommitted are willing to come over. Some of them still haven't come over. I'm sure that some of them will not come over until the convention, uh, and I, I'm not absolutely sure that all of them will come over to President Ford, although I believe the bulk of them will. Could, although you think it's locked up for Mr. Ford, could things still change in in what actually happens on the convention floor at Kansas City? Well, in this close a contest, anything can happen. I mean... Uh, for, could I use one example, for sure. instance? There is talk, as Jim was referring to, to the so-called Trojan horse delegations. North Carolina, um, Florida, to name a couple. Yeah. Um, and where Mr. Ford, by virtue of having won the primaries, has the first ballot for the nomination loyalty of some of those delegates, but as they are believed to be some of them, I think the number mentioned is about 75 Reagan sympathizers, could they not on procedural votes before the nomination, if there were such procedural votes, like on changing the rules, affect the outcome? Well, they could, but uh, first of all, the president did not win the North Carolina primary. He got 25 delegates, I think it is, and the Reagan got 28. But uh, the fact is that uh, they can affect, uh, there can be a change. Uh, but I don't think that uh, it'll happen because it, if it does happen that way, if people uh, try to, to uh, resort to subterfuge to undermine what uh, happened in the primaries, then I think it obviates the necessity to have primaries and it also obviates the necessity to a certain extent to have a convention at all. There's no point in having a convention if it's just a, some kind of a game when you get out there. Are you saying it still could, even though Mr. Ford appears to you to have it locked up, it still could go the other way because what happens between now and then or there? Well, I tell you, I have an abiding faith in the honesty and the principles of the people who are involved in this in all the states. And I think the Ford forces and the Reagan forces and the people who support both are honorable people, basically. And I don't think any of them want to undermine uh, anybody. And I think they want to they want to wind up with uh, after that convention with a candidate that's electable. And in order to be electable, he has to have support of his party and he has to have support of people who feel that things have been done in a fair way. So I don't, I don't look for any untoward maneuvers. Thank you. Jim? All right, uh, Mr. Curtis, I, uh, to interpret, uh, at least my interpretation of what Mr. White and Mr. Rosenbaum's response to your charges were simply that they poo-pooed them and that it was political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also what the President Ford said when he was asked about this Saturday, he, mm -hmm. to you about your charges, he said, oh, well, uh, my good friend Tom is a, uh, a Reagan man, it's something to be expected, it's all politics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your answer, how do you, is it just politics? Are you just playing a game? Is this just rhetoric? Of course it isn't politics. As a matter of fact, uh, I just came from the job of being umpire as chairman of the Federal Election Commission. Mr. Ford named me to that because of the work I'd done over the years in campaign reform and reform of the Congress. Uh, 
the new laws we now have, 1971 election laws, and the 1974 laws that created the Election Commission and gave federal money to the two political parties to run the campaigns are all designed to try to bring about fairness. Now, I noticed that Mr. White talked about politics as usual. He said, I've always done it this way. Well, I've got news for Mr. White. The laws are changed. The fact that uh, the two political parties are taking public money to run the campaigns, and both chairmen of the, of the two parties came before the election commission time after time and said, yes, we realize that we must run our affairs, the convention, in a fair way for all candidates. Now, if these rules don't make so much difference, why not put some Reagan representatives on some of these uh, uh, convention, or the uh, convention, the party convention committees, mm -hmm. uh, so that you would balance it off? or uh, even, even more so. Right now, I've spelled out exactly what's wrong. Why don't they dress themselves to this imbalance of gallery tickets? Correct it right now. Then we'll have no problem. I'll be very pleased to then praise the Ford people for understanding well, the importance of having fair play. I guess he needs the title of congressman. Congressman, yeah. there will be a proportionate representation of Reagan people on the basis of the selection of delegates. The body of this convention is made up of delegates that are elected by people either through primary caucus or what else throughout this whole country. And this is what is, is happening there. And there will be well, equal and proportional representation on each one of these committees by the individuals who have been elected the, as such. And those the, are the rules. Yes, those are the rules of the yes, game. And you know it as well as I do. I do, do when the delegates take over, but in the beginning, the, the, national the National Committee, committee is composed of three people from I'll, each state who may, were elected, were nominated by the state, I intervene, elected but, by the last national convention of this party of ours, that's, and I mean, now, they run the rules of the party. Well, all right, and that's exactly the group I'm talking about, and they're the ones that have put only Ford people in these preliminary offices. These are the people who refuse yeah. to understand this part of fair play or even understand that their job now right. is to be an umpire. Let me, we're not going to resolve this issue right now, but let me ask Mr. Reed, uh, it goes back to a point that you made earlier. The perception, actually, let me ask you, the perception of fairness is almost as important as the reality of fairness. Are you concerned at all that no matter who wins this, it's so tight and it's come down to these nitty gritty, you know, very, uh, uh, well, nitty-gritty problems and disputes like we've just heard between uh, Cliff White and Tom Curtis. Are you concerned at all about whether what the scars yeah. this is going to leave? I mean, see, I, I, I respectfully take my friends of some 10 years each uh, are off target, both of them. I, I'm concerned with the, the perception that's in the eyes of the, of the beholder. Uh, regardless of whether it's law, or whether it's party rules, or this is the way the game is played, it's as perceived. If uh, if, but I, and I am optimistic about the outcome. I've had a very, very wary eye, but this is my natural skepticism from the history of our parties and all of what other procedures, and I've been very critical. But I want to say right quick, I'm optimistic that things will work out well, that we will have, uh, uh, it will be proper and perceived as such. But that is, that is where, the, where the ball game is. That's the judge and jury, mm -hmm. not, not the Federal Election Commission, not the RNC. It's as perceived by both sides, by the public at large, by the uh, Reagan or Ford forces that lose. Mm -hmm. That is the perception, that's what counts. And so, regardless, to be hung up, as I'm concerned, as, as I say, the Ford lawyers have been playing with dynamite, in my opinion, by writing letters, questioning from the top down, I'm very concerned about that. Maybe go on the other side, I haven't seen it. But that's my concern, not either or the RNC rules or yeah. whether there's fair or the law, that's my concern. Could I uh, just comment there just briefly, that really is why I'm happy to appear publicly and why this isn't behind the scenes. Get it out in the public and let's examine it. I think it's highly unfair. Now we're discussing it. All right. Robin? Yeah, I was just wondering how the party is going to suffer from this infighting, to pick up on Mr. Um, on Mr. Reed's point. How can the party, which is both of whose candidates are already substantially behind the presumptive candidate of the Democrats in the polls. How is the party going to reunite itself, whether Mr. Ford wins or Mr. Reagan wins? Mr. Reed. Well, I would, I would say uh, against our opponent, uh, Mr. Carter is, 
I think even his strongest supporters would admit is the at his zenith this week at the height of the, uh, uh, as you said, the uh, rather dull convention going on there, Robin. So I think uh, if we have an issue campaign, the few issues that I know Mr. Carter has taken is very, uh, they're, they're not in tune with the, the region where he's supposed to be so strong. But, is, but is, wasn't your point, Mr. Reed, that uh, if the Reagan supporters or the Ford supporters are left bitter by the convention procedures that some of them may just stay home or sit on their hands and even they most of them are are only a faction or a part of the Republican Party uh, this is my concern but Robin I'm optimistic that uh, uh, even though with my great concern and watchdog activity uh, I'm confident that both sides will play it straight in the end because one, one thing I think this process which I believe so much in is to a great degree self-policing I think if either side, over, as close as it is, if either side overdoes the uh, chicanery, maybe it's a too strong word for it, but uh, that or something else, we'll lose. So I think it's self-policing, and I think that uh, I'm optimistic that we will come out of it well, how, well united. Mr. Rosenbaum, how do you feel about that as a man associated often with Governor Rockefeller and the sort of moderate Republican wing? How do you feel about the way the party is going to come out of this struggle? Well, I think we wouldn't even be in this struggle if it weren't for the fact that there's a Un totally unfair and, and serious uh, disproportionate distribution of delegates. Sure, uh, sure, and I think that's a lot more important than having a few people in important positions on the, uh, in, sp in spots in the National Convention. So uh, you this mean whole Mr. thing Reagan is amusing. You have me. the support he had if the delegates hadn't been apportioned differently by well, the... He would have the, he would have the support that he has, but uh, Ford would have a lot more support than he's got in proportion to the population of the states, such as New York, based on... Uh, uh, the way this thing has worked out, uh, Ford would be several hundred votes ahead if the formula was actually uh, a, a uh, one on one formula. But uh, uh, as far as putting the party back together again or what have you, I think this is like one of those family fights where the family in, inside squabbles, but when it comes to a common foe, uh, the family pulls together and uh, can Mr. be successful. Mr. White, isn't the history of these things that the party that savages itself at its convention and just before? quite often loses the succeeding election. Sure, that, that's the history if you want to go back over the last 20 years. But I think that your analogy, which is much more realistic and which I think is what will happen this time, goes to 1952. And I think the measure and the capacity of the Republican Party and the convention to put itself together in 1976 will be measured by the two men. In 1952, uh, it was Bob Taft and Dwight David Eisenhower. These two men were great men, and they got together. The same thing is going to happen this year. Are they going to get together on one ticket? Well, they are, that will be the decision of the convention, okay. because we'll I believe to, in that. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you, gentlemen in Washington. Thanks, Jim. Thank you both here. Jim Lehrer and I will be back tomorrow night when we'll have a look at the Democrats. Good night. For a transcript of tonight's program, send $1 to The Robert McNeil Report, Box 345, New York, New York, 10019. This program was produced by WNET and WETA, who are solely responsible for its content. It was made possible in part by grants from public television stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Thank you.